Hello everyone and welcome. We're going to be looking at the 2025 Acute Coronary Syndromes Guidelines. So let's jump right in. One of the biggest things that I saw that kind of stood out to me was the changes to dual antiplatelet therapy. Yes. So tell me a little bit about those. The 2025 guidelines, they now prefer Tcogrelor or Prashagrel over Clopidogrel for patients undergoing PCI. Okay, so that's a big change. Why the switch? Well, there's a large body of evidence suggesting that Tocogler and Prashagril are better at preventing ischemic events. Okay. But of course, bleeding is always a concern with any antiplatelet therapy. Right. And so the guidelines acknowledge this and recommend 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin plus a P2Y12 inhibitor in patients who are at low risk for bleeding. Okay. So that is a little bit different than prior recommendations. Yes. Um, what are some of the things that we can do to try to mitigate the bleeding risk? I know the guidelines have some tips on that. Yeah, so they recommend PPIs for patients at risk for GI bleeding, and they also recommend considering switching to ticagrelor monotherapy after one month of dual antiplatelet therapy if the patient has tolerated it well. Okay, what if a patient needs to be on long-term anticoagulation? In those cases, the guidelines recommend discontinuing aspirin between one and four weeks after the procedure and continuing a P2Y12 inhibitor. And in those cases, clopidogrel is actually preferred. Okay, that's good to know. Another thing that stood out to me that was kind of exciting is they're recommending the use of intracoronary imaging a lot more. Yes. So this is a brand new recommendation, urging clinicians to use it more often for complex lesions during PCI. Absolutely. This is the first time the guidelines have recommended this. Okay, so why is this so important? Well, um... You know, intracoronary imaging allows us to see those complex lesions and really get detailed pictures, and that allows us to be more precise with our interventions and ultimately leads to better outcomes for our patients. So it seems like this is maybe becoming more of the standard of care. Are there any specific lesions that they recommend we use it for, or is it more just kind of like the clinician judgment? Yeah, that's a great question. So the guidelines don't give us specific recommendations about using it for certain types of lesions, um, but the evidence is pretty clear that better visualization does lead to better results. And so, you know, in many complex situations, it's probably a good idea to consider it. Okay, great. And then another kind of truly brand new recommendation is the inclusion of guidance on mechanical circulatory support. Yes, this is the first time that they've included this. Right. And they recommend a microaxial flow pump like the Impella CP in select patients with cardiogenic shock, especially those with STEMI. Okay, wow, this is groundbreaking. So tell me a little bit about the studies that have kind of supported this. Well, one study, for example, is the Danger Shock trial. And that study showed that routine use of these pumps reduced 180-day mortality compared to standard care. That's amazing. But I imagine there's some risks that we have to consider as well. Absolutely. So while these pumps offer potential benefits, we also need to be aware of the risks, which include bleeding limb ischemia and the potential need for renal replacement therapy. So really, really thinking about carefully selecting those patients who will benefit the most and maybe thinking about those factors that might make it less appropriate. Exactly. Okay, great. Let's move on to complete revascularization. Okay. What are the new recommendations there? So the guidelines haven't changed too much in this area. They still recommend complete revascularization for both STEMI and NSTEMI patients, meaning that we should address all significant blockages. Okay, how do we decide between CABG and multivessel PCI? Well, it really depends on the complexity of the coronary artery disease and the patient's comorbidities, and the guidelines offer some guidance on how to make that decision. What about patients who present with cardiogenic shock? Does that change our management at all? Yes, so for patients with cardiogenic shock, we do revascularize the culprit vessel immediately, but we don't routinely perform PCI on non-culprit arteries. Interesting, why is that? The evidence suggests that in this specific situation, the risk outweighs the benefit. And that's why we don't do routine PCI on non-culprit arteries in patients with cardiogenic shock. Okay, that makes sense. All right, secondary prevention. What are some of the big things that we need to know? So secondary prevention is all about preventing future events. And the guidelines do a nice job covering this. So first of all, all patients should be on high intensity statins. And the guidelines also provide a nice algorithm for when to add ezetimia evolocumab or laricoparas based on the patient's LDL level. Can you walk us through that a little bit? What are those levels and kind of how do we use them to make those decisions? Sure. So if a patient is on maximally tolerated statin therapy and their LDL is 70 milligrams per deciliter or higher, 
then we would add one of those medications. And if it's between 55 and 69 milligrams per deciliter, then we need to consider other risk factors, such as family history, smoking status, and other comorbidities. So really customizing that prevention plan for each patient. Exactly. And that's what's so great about these guidelines is they're not one size fits all. They really allow us to tailor the care to the individual patient. I like that. What about cardiac rehabilitation? Cardiac rehabilitation is an important part of secondary prevention, and the guidelines recommend referring patients to either a traditional or a home-based cardiac rehab program. Okay, so it's nice that we have options there. Are there certain patients that do better with one versus the other, or is it really just patient preference? Yeah, yeah so the guidelines don't really specify which one is better, um, but they do recommend taking into account patient preference and also what's available to them and, you know, really having a conversation with the patient and coming up with a plan together. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about red blood cell transfusions. Okay. So, um, you know, red blood cell transfusions are obviously very common in this patient population. But what do the 2025 acute coronary syndromes guidelines say about them? Okay. So for patients who are not bleeding... Right. The guidelines mention that it might be reasonable to maintain a hemoglobin of 10 grams per deciliter using red blood cell transfusions. Yes. So why 10? Well, we want to make sure that the tissues are getting adequate oxygen delivery, especially in these patients who have a heart that's under stress. But we know that blood transfusions also have their own risks associated with them. Absolutely. And so the guidelines remind us to always weigh the risks and benefits and make decisions about transfusions on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, good point. The guidelines also touch on when to use an invasive strategy for patients with NSTEMI. Yes. So can you walk us through kind of how we decide that and what the recommendations are? Sure. So we don't use the same approach for every patient with NSTEMI. It really depends on their risk. So it's individualized. Exactly. So for patients who are at intermediate or high risk, the guidelines recommend an early invasive strategy with revascularization during their hospital stay. Why is that? Well, because these patients are at higher risk and an invasive strategy allows us to directly address the underlying coronary artery disease and hopefully prevent future events. What about those lower risk patients? For those patients, we need to gather more information and do further risk stratification to decide whether they would benefit from revascularization or if a more conservative approach is warranted. So it seems like these guidelines really emphasize the importance of individualizing care. Absolutely. All right, let's talk a little bit about PCI. Okay. What are some of the key updates there? So, the guidelines recommend using a radial approach for PCI over a femoral approach. And why is that? Well, the radial approach has been shown to be safer with lower rates of bleeding and vascular complications. Good to know. We talked about intracoronary imaging before. Yes. What is its role during PCI? So during PCI, intracoronary imaging can be used to visualize complex lesions and give us a better understanding of the anatomy of the arteries, which can help us be more precise with our interventions and ultimately lead to better outcomes. Sounds like a really useful tool. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, technology is really changing the way we practice medicine, and this is a great example of that. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's switch gears one more time and talk about secondary prevention. Okay. What are some of the key takeaways there? Well, first of all, it's important to monitor lipid levels, and the guidelines recommend checking a fasting lipid panel four to eight weeks after starting or changing lipid-lowering therapy. Why is that follow-up so important? Well, it allows us to see how the patient is responding to therapy and make adjustments as needed to ensure that we're getting their lipids to goal. Um, one thing we should talk about is ticagrelor and prosugrel. Okay. And when we should give them before angiography in patients with NSTEMI. Okay, so tell me more about that. So if we're planning to do an angiography more than 24 hours after a patient presents with NSTEMI, right. the guidelines recommend giving either clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or prosugrel before the procedure. Okay, and what's the advantage of doing that? Well, it's been shown to reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. Okay, that makes sense because it gets that antiplatelet effect working sooner. Exactly right. We want to reduce that time window where they're vulnerable. Right, okay. Awesome. These 2025 guidelines really cover a lot of ground. They do, and they're really based on the latest and greatest evidence, and I think they're going to make a big difference in how we care for patients with ACS. Let me leave you with one final thought. How are you going to use this information to change your practice? That is a great question, and I hope we've sparked your interest in these new guidelines. I really encourage everyone to go check them out and learn more. That is all for today's discussion. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for watching.
please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.